Welcome to the Leadership Lyceum, a CEO's virtual mentor. Now, here's your host, Tom Lindquist. Glad to have you back in the Leadership Lyceum, where we bring you direct access to top CEOs and directors of boards in an interview format that provides insight on situational issues that confront CEOs every day. It is a CEO's virtual mentor. If you haven't joined us in a while, you may have missed the announcement that we formed two companies under Leadership Lyceum's brand. Lyceum Leadership Consulting, which provides executive and board of director search, board effectiveness review, and an array of services for successor development and board readiness. And Lyceum Leadership Productions, which brings you this podcast. We have an exciting episode today in three segments. Segment one is a continuation of our discussion on shareholder activism with Chris Young from Credit Suisse. We'll cover what Chris describes as the vulnerability framework. We'll discuss the conditions that make a company particularly vulnerable to activism. In segment two, we'll be joined by Alan Leverett, president and CEO of WEC Energy Group in Milwaukee. We'll discuss how WEC Energy Group reshaped itself through M&A over the past 10 years into a vastly different company that serves 4.4 million customers across four states in the upper Midwest. In segment three, we'll continue our discussion with Tanuja Daney on derailers to leadership in the boardroom. We'll be right back. Last episode, episode 11, we introduced a spot called Famous Last Words. Our Famous Last Words spot will run through this entire episode. These excerpts are from MGM's 1954 movie, Executive Suite, starring William Holden, Barbara Stanwyck, and Frederick March. And for those utility enthusiasts, also starring the PPL building or Pennsylvania Power and Light building in Allentown, Pennsylvania, as the exterior for the Treadway Corporation. Let me set up this climactic scene. Avery Bullard, president of the Treadway Corporation, has died, but he never named a clear successor, so the board members must choose. The most likely candidate is Lauren Shaw, a skilled businessman with a high degree of financial acumen. Their intense and consequential boardroom discussion will weave through our episode. And by the way, these are skilled actors in a fictional situation. Please don't try this with your own companies. We're into the nominations, and I was just trying to make clear to everyone here what I believe to be the only sound basis for corporation management today. When the average stockholder buys Treadway stock, he makes an investment. Now, the only reason he makes it is to get a return. And that's why I believe that corporation today must be governed to be what its owners want it to be and have paid for it to be. A financial institution yielding the highest and safest return on investment. You know why more and more corporations today are drawing their leaders from the ranks of controllers and investment bankers? Because the problems that come to the president's office today are predominantly financial. I get it. Manufacturing and selling don't count anymore. Of course they count, Fred, but they're not ends in themselves. Only the means to the end. It's a matter of management levels. I just said it. At the presidential level, the emphasis must be financial. dramatic, consternation-filled subject of shareholder activism in the second of a three-part miniseries on shareholder activism with Chris Young, head of contested situations at Credit Suisse. Today, we'll cover what Chris calls the vulnerability framework. Let's join our discussion. Let's talk about vulnerability framework. Yeah. Let's talk about that and what those yeah, principal yeah. areas are that you see or yeah. that you'd advise a CEO and a board to make sure they're watching. Yeah, I think a lot of it is common sense, of course, right? Shareholder return on a relative basis against the peers, the index, right? I mean, if you're underperforming from a shareholder returns perspective, you're going to have an unhappy shareholder mm-hmm. base. That shareholder base is going to be more open to an activist coming in and presenting what I mentioned before, that free option, right? Why why not? Particularly if that underperformance has been sustained, not just in the past six months or one year, but maybe you've underperformed one, three, five years are numbers that people typically look at. Um, I'd also look at your trading multiple. Are you trading at a depressed multiple? Activists really are, at bottom, value investors. To say value investors on steroids, right? They don't wait for the market to prove that the value was inappropriately low. They try to unlock that value. They seek to be a catalyst to unlock it. So if you've got a low PE or EBITDA multiple compared to your peers, that makes you more attractive. 
you know, strategic missteps. You did some M and A, and it didn't work out well, and the integration's not going well. And sell side research is writing sort of critical commentary on sort of the execution of the business. You're in a consolidating sector where a lot of M and A is happening. Well, you may be urged to join the M and A party by an activist, whether you want to or not. I'd say it's really relative underperformance. Again, it could also be relative underperformance on margins, for example. You know, on operational metrics, growth. As I mentioned, we're seeing more on the operational side. Your balance sheet looks different than your peers. You have a lot more cash than your peers. You're going to be identified and screened for that. The argument's going to be you have too much cash. Why aren't you like your peers? You should return some of it. Your returns on invested capital has become an increased focus for activists. So capital allocation is perceived to be poor compared to your peers. All of those things are characteristics of activist targets and activists will screen for them. It's very easy to screen for them. We screen for them to identify our clients that we're likely deemed to be good targets. That's the first step. The second step is you could be sort of the worst performing company in the world, but if there isn't a solution, if the activist doesn't see a catalyst to fix, then they're not going to invest, right? So there's that second part. There's an underperformance, sort of a dragging valuation, and then there's, I've got an idea to fix it. Whether that's increasing your buyback or you're too subscale, you should be sold to a larger competitor. You know, you go back to Carl Icahn and a lot of his activity in biotech land. It was the same theory over and over. You've got one drug, your patent's going to run out. You've got a high R&D budget. You haven't developed any other drugs. Oh, by the way, Big Pharma's over here. Their pipeline is dry. Sell yourself for a nice premium to Big Pharma, right? And I'll capture the takeover premium as a shareholder of the target. And he did that very successfully over and over again. But if there are no buyers, and say Big Pharma wasn't in the mood to buy, well, that theory doesn't work. It's both. It's relative underperformance performance in the broad sense and then there's a perceived fix that the activist feels that they can convince the company to take on its own. I think they would prefer that or they can try to force the company to take, which is all the stuff you read about in the paper. Take our own case. Jesse and his staff done a wonderful job of reducing costs on our finishing operation. We all appreciate the creative effort that's been poured into our experimental program at the Pike Street plant. But the truth is such efforts add comparatively little to our net earnings, even when they succeed. Last year, they contributed less than a quarter of what we gained from one new tax accounting procedure I got the government to approve. So you see, that one piece of work, all purely... Yeah, for we see, all make. right. While Jesse and Don are turning out product, you figure jugglers and chartmen are busy fly-specking it with decimal points. Well, some of us have had enough of it, and some of us are sick to our stomachs from it. I've had enough of that attitude. I know how I've been regarded around here by most of you. Efficiency has become a dirty word. Budget control has a bad odor. Well, that's my job, that's my responsibility. To plug every profit leak. To run to earth every single case of waste and inefficiency in this company. If I have to step on toes and hurt feelings in the process, that can't be helped. But nobody's gonna say I ever had anything but the best interest of this company at heart while I was doing it. You take a look at the record of the last three years. Fight that record, my record. Back with Chris Young, head of the Contested Situations Group at Credit Suisse. And when do you call something, Chris, a contested situation? Yeah. And maybe it starts with the letter or the call, but... To me, that's why I came up with the term, because whether it's hostile M&A, whether, and we're talking activism today, but I also cover that. Mm-hmm. That's by definition contested. Sure. Or friendly M&A, we represented Dell, Michael Dell and his buyout. That was a greed deal, but some shareholders didn't like the term, and so that was contested meaning management trying to get the deal approved. Some shareholders are not liking the deal or the terms of the deal. The terms were contested. Activism, it becomes contested in my mind when there's a disagreement about the future path of the company. Mm -hmm. Just because an activist, a well-known activist, takes a position and then has that meeting, there have been situations I've worked on where the management team is like, well, we actually agree with what the activist is saying. We've been talking about this at the board level for a while. Maybe on the margins there's some differences, but we agree in principle. So you may say that that's not a contested situation, (laughs) right? They end up doing it maybe faster than they otherwise would have done. 
it becomes contested when no way we're not going to do that. They want us to sell. No, we're the acquirer in this sector. What are you talking about? It's pretty easy to identify what a contested situation is. Disagreement over something fundamental around the company, its strategy, its plan, its use of, again, a balance sheet, its capital allocation, and then that disagreement is not able to be resolved through negotiation. Are there some telltale signs? If you're the board, you're the CEO, CFO, are there some telltale signs that activism is looming and poking around? Well, I mean, again, there's those screens that I think that we certainly run. I'm sure other advisors can run. From HFR? Uh, uh, HFR, it's just we have our own screens that we run. The paper you refer to, we have a cash flow return on investment tool here called Holt that a lot of investors use. We have developed a screen, then we back test it, and it's fairly predictive. But other advisors run their versions of screens using those metrics. Mm -hmm. Shareholder return against a peer group, multiple against a peer group, margins against a peer group, maybe hedge fund ownership, as many different metrics as you want to put into it. So that's one thing. And you can see maybe where you show up on that screen. And if that screen is similar to what an activist uses, then you can assume that you're showing up on the screens of the activists. Yeah, We get a lot of calls just the company's doing well and it's numbers, right? And there's a big drop. And one day where it announces a deal that the market wasn't expecting and it drops 20%, you should be thinking that you may be suddenly show up on that screen that you didn't show up on yesterday because of that big one-day or three-day drop in your stock price. Sometimes we tell companies to, if they start hearing new questions when they're out on the road talking to investors, but it's the same question sort of phrased differently or frankly using some of the same words that they haven't used. You've never been asked about capital allocation before, now you're being asked about it in every meeting. And then even some of the words are the same. Maybe an indication that an activist has been poking around, suggesting those ideas to some of your mainstream investors. I call it sort of an echo effect that you should just sort of be attuned to. Another sign is you get asked, you know, the conferences that so many management teams go to. They meet with investors. Sometimes they do one-on-ones. And suddenly the name of, let's say, an Elliot, a well-known activist, shows up that never wanted to meet with you before. Well, your team, your IR team, should know the list. Shark Watch, which is owned by fact set has something called the shark watch 50 50 names of sort of the leading activists and if you've never been asked for a meeting or an audience by one of the activists well it doesn't mean you're going to become a target but it certainly can be the first step towards you becoming one there are our stock watch services that will purport to be able to tell companies when they believe hedge funds are amassing a stake before regulatory requirements would dictate that you disclose it so that's another way management knows when they're not doing well against their peer set. Prudence dictates you should be preparing for a potential for an activist to take a position when you're in that position. But also when you're doing pretty well, we'd say maybe it's not on the top of your list, but you should still be thinking about it. And I think more and more management teams are because they realize, again, as I just mentioned, one bad quarter, one poorly received M&A announcement, and suddenly they were ranked high of vulnerability on the screen, and now they are. So to understand what's going on in the market, and there's some certain steps that you can take that don't take a lot of time that put you in a better position to deal with an activist if they arrive. You mentioned not a lot of activism that you're seeing in the power and utility yeah. space. We had talked quietly about there were two situations. We didn't talk in any detail yeah. about them. But when you talk about maybe one of the fundamental settings which you'd find activism, and that's where maybe the industry is ripe for some consolidation yeah. and there's a trend towards that. And that certainly yeah. is a case that we've seen over the last 25 years in utilities, a yes. tremendous amount of consolidation. So if you're kind of in that environment, is there any advice? If you are in an industry that is perceived to be ripe for consolidation, that sell-side analysts are supportive of consolidation, that most importantly mainstream investors believe the industry or sector, subsector should be consolidated. You're vulnerable to being pushed into consolidating. It's one of the easiest strategies for an activist. It's a home run for them to take a position whatever sector it is, but if you're talking utilities, take a position a company they believe will be consolidated, right? Not the consolidator and to agitate to make that deal happen and capture the expected takeover premium over a pretty short period of time, often using leverage. When you do all the math, that's a tremendous annual rate of return for that investment. And so I would just say, again, if you feel you're one of the companies in a sector that is consolidating that's likely to be consolidated, then you need to be prepared for that eventuality. And what can you do, say, a year out? What can you do? I mean, the best defense, again, 
again to activism, it's a cliche, but it's true, is high performance, high multiple, right? To the extent that you're maybe one of the smaller firms in a sector and therefore by definition would be considered maybe a target rather than the acquirer. If you're trading at a high multiple because you're performing on all cylinders and one of your peers is trading at a lower multiple, that peer is going to be more vulnerable than you are because you're more expensive, right? Mm. It's like that old joke, you know, with the bear and the two guys. I don't have to be faster than the bear. I have to be faster than you, right? So, <laughs> and it's easy to say, perform better. But I mean, that's really what it is. Amongst your peer group, try not to be the laggard. If you're the laggard, the bear will catch you, right? Your record, Sean? Couldn't have been done without me. Understand, I don't mean to be little, Mr. Bullard. We all recognize his magnificent contribution to this company during its period of growth. In other words, Avery Bullard was the right kind of man to save this company from disaster, to build it up and set it on its way. But now we need a different kind of management, one that will dedicate itself to paying the maximum dividends to the stockholders. Is that it? I don't know that I'd express it in exactly those terms, but yes, that's substantially what I do mean. Shaw, let me ask you something. The president of a company like Treadway would have to be a man of outstanding qualities, wouldn't he? Naturally. The man prepared to make a good many personal sacrifices, willing to devote himself to the company mind and heart, body and soul. If you're the right man, there'd be no worry on that score. Why? Why would he do it? What would be his incentive? You know, outside of salary. There's such a thing as success, isn't there? A sense of accomplishment. Exactly. Now let's assume, Shaw, that you're the man running the Treadway Corporation your way. Would you be satisfied to measure your life's work by how much you raise the dividend? Would you regard your life as a success just because you managed to get the dividend to $3 or $4 or 5 or 6 or 7 Would that be enough? Is that what you want engraved on your tombstone when you die, the dividend record of the Treadway Corporation? Are you suggesting that earnings aren't important? I'm suggesting no such thing and you know it. Shaw's right when he says that we have an obligation to our stockholders. But it's a bigger obligation than raising the dividend. We have an obligation to keep this company alive, not just this year or next or the year after that. Sometimes you have to use your profits for the growth of the company, not pay them all out in dividends to impress the stockholders with your management record. There's your waste, Shaw. There's your inefficiency. Stop growing and you die. Turn your back on experimentation and planning for tomorrow because they don't contribute to dividends today and you won't have a tomorrow because there won't be any company. segment one. We'll continue this discussion with Chris Young in October with episode 13. We'll take apart the activist playbook and take you step by step through the escalation path and introduce the CEO into the discussion with his experience with activism along that escalation path. We're on to segment two. We welcome Alan Leverett to the program. Alan was appointed president and CEO of WEC Energy Group in May of 2016. As one of the youngest CEOs of investor-owned utilities, Alan brings verve to industry leadership, but also a deep respect for the past. As a matter of fact, Alan and I gathered for this discussion back in February in his company's vintage boardroom inside an architectural and historical gem of a building in downtown Milwaukee. The heavily renovated public service building is a Beaux Arts classical revival masterpiece. The building opened in 1905 as the downtown interurban passenger train depot for the Milwaukee Electric Railway and Light Company. At its height, the system of electric railways served the entire city of Milwaukee. The last interurban line was abandoned in 1951, and the city's last streetcar was discontinued in 1958. But I digress. Let's join our discussion. WEC Energy Group, based in Milwaukee, is one of the nation's premier energy companies, serving 4.4 million customers in four states, Wisconsin, Illinois, Michigan, and Minnesota. The company's principal utilities are WE Energies in Milwaukee, Wisconsin Public Service in Green Bay, People's Gas, serving the city of Chicago, North Shore Gas, which is the northern suburbs along the lake shore of Chicago, Michigan Gas Utilities, and Minnesota Energy Resources. I'm here with Alan Leverett today, and thank you, Alan, for having me in on short notice. Sure. Thanks for having me. A little bit of a timeline, maybe, to set just the evolution of the company up. Ten years ago, Wisconsin Public Service, which at the time was a separate company, completed its merger with Peoples in Chicago and North Shore in Chicago, forming Integris Energy. And just prior to that, I think maybe one year before that, 
Wisconsin Public Service had purchased the Michigan and Minnesota gas utilities from Aquila at the time. Yep, I believe that's right, Tom. And then We Energies purchased Integris in the summer of 2015. So if you look back really over the past 10 years, the significant growth and what a difference a decade mm -hmm. makes, a great example really of consolidation in the industry. And Alan, just to focus on you, just over a year ago, you were appointed president of the company under Gail Clapa, and then a little less than a year ago in May of 2016 as CEO of the overall company. And as CEO, you preside over really a uniquely different company to the one you joined 14 years ago. How do you think about the company in these still early months of your tenure as CEO? You use the words uniquely different, mm -hmm. and maybe we'll just talk about the differences, and I think that naturally gets into how we think differently about the business. You put your finger on a couple of things that are very different. The first thing is it's a much larger natural gas business than it was before. Mm -hmm. Certainly, Wisconsin Public Service, before they, they bought the Aquila properties and merged with Peoples, they certainly had a gas business you know, of their own because mm -hmm. they were a combined utility in Green Bay. We were also a combined utility in Milwaukee, but when you put the two companies together, when you put Integris together and you put Legacy Wisconsin Energy together, we're the eighth largest natural gas utility in the country. So all of a sudden, you're most certainly not just running an electric utility with an afterthought of a natural gas utility. You're running a very, very large natural gas enterprise. That causes us to think differently about capital allocation. So nearly half of the business, in terms of the capital expenditures, is committed to the natural gas business. And it's only right now a quarter of our rate base. We're going to take the natural gas business on a rate base basis from being roughly a quarter of our business to be nearly a third of our business over the next five years. One of the things that we think about differently are the natural gas business. It's caused us to look at things that historically we've never done at our Wisconsin gas utilities. So historically, the gas utilities in Wisconsin never owned underground natural gas storage of their own. So they had to have a collection of short and long-term leases, but they never actually owned any storage of their own. What we learned with our Illinois utilities in Michigan, they have owned storage of their own. Big benefit for customers to have that. Also a very nice investment for the investors. So what that caused us to do is to want to look very seriously at underground storage for our Wisconsin utilities. Now, the geology in Wisconsin, you can't build storage here. So we've got a proposal in front of the commission where one of our subsidiaries would buy a very large field in the sort of more southeastern portion of Michigan. We'd buy that field in a subsidiary. The subsidiary would have service agreements back to the Wisconsin utilities because of the overall ownership structure of these companies. Effectively, they'd own or they'd have something that would look very much like ownership of those assets. The other big difference for us is really having multi-states. Historically, we certainly had, we operated in two states. Most of the company was in Wisconsin, some operations in Michigan, certainly even with legacy Wisconsin Energy. But now we have significant operations in four states. That has caused us to be able to create many more opportunities for our management employees mm. to move around between the companies. That's certainly something that I saw in my history, my former employer at Southern, I certainly think that makes for good development of executive management employees. It also brings some regulatory diversity to the investors. So whereas before, if you were buying, say, legacy Wisconsin Energy, it was overwhelmingly a Wisconsin-based company, and we still have two-thirds of our company by rate base is in Wisconsin, but now we have some additional diversity across some other very good state jurisdictions, and they balance the interest of customers and investors very well. Well, I saw, Alan, your forecasted capital expenditures over the next five years are about $10 billion, I, right. I believe. And you mentioned earlier that half of that capex is going to gas. It sounds to me like a big lift and a big responsibility for a utility. How does that compare in prior years? And I guess it's not fair to compare because you're such a different utility. But uh, It's hard to compare because the company is so much bigger, mm -hmm. uh, certainly, than it was before. I mean, if you looked at 
our rate base, total rate base, at the end of last year, we were about $18 billion. So now you certainly will have depreciation over the next few years, so you're not adding 10 to 18. You know, it's something on a net basis much smaller than that. So although 10 sounds like a great deal, and it is, Mm -hmm. on a base of $18 billion, that's something that we view as being very manageable. And when you look at the spending Quite a bit of the spending is in a handful of very large programs. And an example of that would be the pipe replacement program down in your city Mm. of Chicago. That's a cast iron system that was largely built between the 1910s and the 1940s. Uh, It was low pressure. The meters were inside the premises. And it's really going to be a 30-year program. But we're going to spend between $250 and $300 million a year on a long-term program to bring all that cast iron main out of the ground, replace it with modern materials, higher pressure put meters outside the premises. So you look at it alone in that five-year program that we talked about, easily a billion and a half of that 10 billion is in that single program. Mm -hmm. It's manageable from a finance standpoint. We have a strong balance sheet. I'm seeing from my vantage point that a lot of your peer companies, there's very large capital expenditure programs as they look forward five years. And I would imagine that for some, that's a big challenge. As you described, the project management personnel, Mm -hmm. they may not have built a large project or that sort of program for decades. You know, in terms of the the talent we have here, it's also very manageable. And large construction programs were really a core competency for us. Again, not on the magnitude of $10 billion and five years, certainly, that if you look back to what the legacy Wisconsin Energy Company did, between the four generation units that we built, two plants, one gas plant, one coal plant, those were the largest infrastructure projects, you know, outside of state government uh, projects in the state's history. We did a good job, very good people that managed those projects, but as an enterprise, we did a good job with those programs. So we had a core competency, that's something we brought to the Integris acquisition. Talk about the electric side. The biggest initiative that we have going on in the electric business is really reshaping the generation portfolio. We really have three key criteria. First and foremost, we want those changes to save our customers money, so we want to reduce costs. Second, we want to preserve a reasonable degree of fuel diversity. So we certainly don't want to be completely dependent on any one source of energy for producing power. So we want to preserve a reasonable amount of fuel diversity. And the third thing is we want to reduce our carbon emissions because I believe very strongly that some form of carbon regulation is inevitable. Being on a path where you can reduce carbon emissions, I believe is a path you want to be on if you can reduce costs and preserve a reasonable amount of fuel diversity at the same time. Let's take a quick break. We'll be right back with Alan Leverett, President and CEO of WEC Energy Group in Milwaukee. We're back with Alan Leverett, President and CEO of WEC Energy Group in Milwaukee. It's interesting, your third area, just reducing carbon emissions, and previous issue was Pedro Pizarro talking about reducing carbon emissions, and it's legislated in California through SB 32, and there's pretty stringent and strict requirements for reducing carbon emissions by 2030 with that. Mm -hmm. But you're doing this, Alan, it looks like very proactively without a legislation requiring you to do that. You're doing it pragmatically. As long as those first two criteria are being met, you're looking for opportunities to reduce carbon. That's right. So I think right now we're being very much driven by the economics on solid fuel plants versus gas plants. Mm -hmm. We're looking at a set of changes Some changes, Tom, we have already announced. Others we're looking at that we're not prepared to announce. But one of the things that we've already announced in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, we're going to retire approximately 360 megawatts of the older coal-fired capacity. We would replace it with roughly half again as much natural gas capacity, which would be very flexible, reciprocating internal combustion engine 
type technology. Very flexible, very modular. So flexible in terms of operation, modular in terms of size. So there's an example where going back to my three criteria, we're going to save approximately $40 million a year in O&M, which is nearly 7% of the O&M budget for the electric piece of We Energy. So we're going to save customers a significant amount of money. Even with this change, retiring some coal to having a little more gas, we're still going to have a very reasonable amount of coal in the mix at We Energies, and we're going to reduce our carbon footprints. Mm. Part of this is also driven by the picture on electric demand. So if you think back to 2008 and you look at our kilowatt hour sales, the volume of electricity that we sold to our customers, we're not back to where we were in 2008. That's why I call 2008 with my employees here the high water mark. So part of what's going on here, Tom, and I think a reason that we can take a pragmatic approach because we have to realistically look at what the coal gas economics are and are really expected to be Mm -hmm. for for a very long time. And we can also look at where we are in terms of the the demand that we're realistically going to serve for quite a while. That allows us to make a set of changes that as a group, check each of those three boxes. Mm -hmm. Let's turn to you. I find it fascinating, Alan, the way you've come up in your career. Your foundation is finance planning. It's more financial treasury related. And I think when you Mm -hmm. came to Wisconsin Energy 14 years ago, you came in as CFO and then developed into becoming CEO. I don't want to talk about ancient history, certainly, but I was giving a talk a few weeks ago to a group of executive MBA students. When I was preparing my talk, I suddenly came to the realization that I've been in this industry for 30 years. For what I stepped into and took on at Wisconsin Energy, you have to go back 30 years almost and talk about the preparation that I had back at Southern Company. I would sort of say the types of things that I had the opportunity to work on certainly was very important, but the thing that was even more important are the people that I was able to work with at Southern. actually did a very wide range of things at Southern Believe it or not, I started on the engineering side of the company because that's where most of my academic training really focused on. What field of engineering? So I did a BS in electrical engineering Mm -hmm. at Vanderbilt, and I did a master's degree in electrical engineering at Stanford. I started in the really technical part of the business. After about seven, eight years, I had the opportunity to go over into the finance group. So when I look back on my career at Southern, roughly 15 years, roughly half of it was in the technical part of the business, and the other half was really in finance. You know, as I think back in terms of the base of experience to bring to a new company, Wisconsin Energy, in July of 2003 when I came here, it was kind of the perfect training to step in to be a senior officer at a public company Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. because my first job was to be CFO. And so in 2011, when I stepped over to be responsible for the generation part of our business, you know, in a sense, I was kind of coming almost full circle. I was sort of going back in a way to the sort of things that I did in that first six, seven, seven, eight years Mm -hmm. of my career at Southern. And Alan, just to go back to Southern a little bit, because Mm -hmm. you described it with the business now that you have and the larger business, the jurisdictional diversity, and that creates opportunities to develop leaders. My experience with Southern from my vantage point, Mm -hmm. how did they do it? How did you experience it then? And how are you doing it? Or are you going to do it here? At Southern, they started with multiple states. Mm -hmm. They started with multiple utilities. And I think the very clear expectation that in order to move up, you're going to have to move around. And my guess would be the expectation is the same. Move around means move around physically to different companies. I started at Southern Company Services in Birmingham. And in 1994, I went over to Atlanta to Southern Company Services. It was made very clear to me that if I wanted to move up anymore, I needed to go to one of the operating companies. So that's how I ended up at Georgia. Your power. That's very much what we're trying to foster here. And so we have quite a number of examples. We had a number of people that we sent down to People's Gas. We've actually sent, at last count, about 12 people of varying seniority levels that we've sent down to Chicago to run that big program to improve the operations of the gas utility, to improve customer service. And at some point, I'm expecting some of those people back in Wisconsin. That's certainly what we're trying to create here again, Mm -hmm. because I think it works very well at Southern. Let's take a quick break. We'll be right back with Alan Leverett, President and CEO of WEC Energy Group in Milwaukee. (laughs) 
We're back with Alan Leverett, President and CEO of WEC Energy Group in Milwaukee. In what follows, we touch on mentors and integrity. What is integrity? I'm kind of an amateur student of history. And one of my favorite historical figures is Abraham Lincoln. One of the reasons that Abraham Lincoln was so successful as a president is a recognition that in his job he needed to learn from people without being threatened. You could talk about integrity in a lot of contexts, politics, business, in your personal life. Let me talk about it in terms of the business context. Integrity means, first off, you treat the resources and the assets of the company almost as if they were your own in terms of the standard of care. The second thing is, and this is particularly important at public companies, there has to be absolute transparency and honesty with the owners of the company. Sometimes that's not always fun because you have to tell bad news just like you tell good news in a very transparent way. Finally, in terms of integrity, there's a level of openness and honesty with the employees. One in particular of my three mentors at Southern, Bill Dahlberg, the chairman and CEO of the company, the one that in particular I viewed as just being a wonderful communicator, tremendously transparent and communicative with the employees. You know, in terms of the information that he would share, his thought process. Here's how I reached that conclusion. So not only what did he look at, how did he decide? Giving a glimpse into how he thinks about these things. I imagine that helped you tremendously in terms of it gives you something to pattern your own way of thinking after. Yes, and it's almost like having a very good teacher. You probably could have gotten to the same level of insight on your own, but because of a good teacher, a good example, you're able to get that insight so much faster. It's very, very important, regardless of what job you're in, to be humble. As soon as you're sort of full of hubris, better watch out. Regardless of what job you're in, having a sense of humility is tremendously important because you always have something to learn. And why do you think that rages out of control if you will. You know, I think having one of these jobs, I'm very fortunate to have the job that I have, but it's a big job and it's probably easy to kind of let your ego get out of control. Mm -hmm. A victim of your own success. Perhaps that's right. Perhaps it's the authority. Perhaps it's the influence that you can have causes people to get kind of full of themselves. Humility, pretty important. And this can be in business as well as politics. People feel like they have to have all the answers. If somebody comes in that's smarter than they are, although they might be at a different level in the organization, they feel threatened. I certainly want to have as many smart people as I can. That recognition that you need to learn from others and you can do that in a way where you're not threatened, well, that's kind of part of being humble. That ends our discussion with Alan Leverett. Let's take a break and we'll be right back with our final segment, segment three. Avery Bullard didn't seem to think my policies were exactly destroying this company. No. No, he didn't. And he was wrong. The way a lot of people are wrong these days. Grabbing for the quick and easy, the sure thing. That's just a lack of faith in the future. Something that's in the air today. The the groping of a lot of men who know they've lost their faith, but aren't sure of what it is or how they happen to lose it. Avery Bullard was one of them. He'd been so busy building a great production machine that he finally lost sight of why he was building it of why he was the man he was, if he ever really knew. Do you know, Mr. Walling? Yes, I think I do. Avery Bullard was driven by pride, pride in himself, the urge to do things that no other man on earth could do. He was the man at the top of the tower, needing no one, wanting no one, only himself. That's what it took to satisfy his pride. That was his strength, and that was his weakness, too. Why shouldn't a man have pride if he's earned it? All right. But why should that set him apart from the people he's working with? The force behind a great company has to be more than the pride of one man. It has to be the pride of thousands. You can't make men work for money alone. You starve their souls when you try it. And you can starve a company to death the same way. with our final segment of the episode. Segment three is a continuation of our discussion on the boardroom with corporate governance expert Tanuja Daini. Tanuja serves on two public company boards and is a frequent speaker on board governance. Most recently, she was part of the instructor panel for the NACD Advanced Director Professionalism Program. I'll be speaking with her, actually, on September 14th in Chicago at the American Bar Association's Business Law Sectional Meeting. 
The subject of the program is Driving Boardroom Diversity, an inside look at what's important and what's next for corporate governance. Tanuja and I will be joined by Kathy Jafari from Ballard's Bar, who will moderate the panel. We hope you'll join us in Chicago that day. Tanuja's upcoming October speaking engagements are listed on the back of the episode's album cover. Let's join our discussion. What are the top derailers or the top issues that come up in effectiveness or lack thereof? I'd say probably the first and foremost is ego and inability to separate yourself from the bigger picture on these particular issues and having to be and train yourself to be objective about this and understand that there is a bigger issue involved and taking the self and the ego out of it. I always talk about this in my writings and speaking. When you're doing succession planning or talent development, sometimes you just need to take the personality out of the picture. Let's take a look at the organization with a fresh piece of paper. Take the personalities out of the picture. What are the key positions that we need? When I do succession planning, I do twofold. Key positions gets one layer of it. Then now let's look at the key players because the key players may not actually line up with your key positions. You may actually have a player that is very deep within your organization but is a key leader for a very important constituency that is off the radar screen. Ego, personality. That's one in the same. I think it's Mm -hmm. one in the same. Mm -hmm. Um, I think entrenchment, that status quoism. This is how we've done it for 50 years. And And is that an individual characteristic or is it a group characteristic? I think it's both. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's why I feel this debate on board independence is so important. There's some writings on this that, you know, after 10 years on a board, how independent can you be? If you look at all directors yeah. out there, the average term, I think, is this was in Spencer Stewart's study, mm-hmm. and I might have to get you the real citation for this. The term is about eight to nine years, but that's actually lower because it's skewed because there are more and more women joining as brand new directors, so their ten years are much shorter than your yeah. average director. I see. If there's about 25% of women on Fortune 500 boards, mm-hmm. most of them are new I see. in the last few years. So entrenchment, so ego, entrenchment, personality. Ego, personality. And it's interesting because these are behavioral, psychological, or sociological phenomena, not rule-based, violating rules of any sort. These are personality-dependent or style And then it does, it is it is kind of contagious. Mm-hmm. And this group thing does happen, as you will see, because when you're on a board, it's this balance of your individuality, your voice, your subject matter expertise, your individual perspective, and having a good dialogue, but balancing that with the collegiality and consensus building that is required to make swift and informed decisions. You have to balance all of those things together. Short-termism? Yes. And that's going to kind of be lumped into being reactive rather than proactive. So what happens is quarterly calls starts to create this cadence where we're basically checking the box at the board level. And so is management. So management spending the nine weeks between board meetings (laughs) working on board materials and earning slides and their SEC filings. And then they're doing the next thing. As soon as that board meeting ends, they have another board meeting that they have to prepare for. There's so much external pressure from shareholders saying that, tell me what you're going to tell me on the next quarterly call. Mm -hmm. And what's lacking is patience, conviction on a long-term strategic plan, a long-term vision for the organization. And that's why I keep harping back to the duties of boards to help promote and create long-term shareholder value. And where is that focus on long-term shareholder value when you're relentlessly focused on the next quarterly call? That's why I'm a proponent of putting strategy on every board agenda. I'd be fine with consent agendas on things that check the box, the report of this, the report of that. Send me stuff in the middle between board meetings so Mm -hmm. that you're not bombarding me at board meetings with a whole ton of information that we're not actually deciding upon. And let's really have a nice executive session and really focus on the substance mm-hmm. and where are we going. And I think boards really have to be relentlessly focused on asking the questions about how does this ladder up to the long-term plan? I know we're taking a short-term action. How does it ladder up? I see one of the criticisms of time in the boardroom to discuss things and to be more reflective and to be more strategic when you're being presented to or people maybe haven't prepared the way they should. You're doing it all live in the boardroom and there isn't time for reflection and patient discussion. Is that the case? Yeah, informed discussion. I mean, we're not living and breathing. The management team is living and breathing every day, Mm -hmm. but we do have to get very smart. There's a lot of liability hanging over our shoulders when you take on a board 
board seat. So we have to make it incumbent upon ourselves to do the homework between the meetings, ask the questions, ask the deeper questions, keep engaged with the management team. There's a fine balance. We don't want to micromanage the management team, but we also, as a board, need to stay on top of things. So sending us reams of investor and analyst reports the day before the board meeting is not helpful. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sending us big industry papers in the middle during the time when we have a little bit more free time could Mm -hmm. be great. Mm -hmm. And have it up on a board portal and tell us it's here. Read up on this or did you see this article or hearing from the CEO reflections of what's going on in the news. It's very important to stay ahead because the thing that's always confounding is when a director goes back to the management team saying, did you see this article that I read in my news feed that has directly related to our company? And the CEO, of course, will say, yes, I did, but is just so busy doing what they're doing. So it's staying ahead of these things. It's difficult to do that. So I think this issue on short-termism, it's potentially toxic and derailing. And that's why it's important to have a good investor relations and good shareholder engagement. But if you're really stuck and your investors are really just relentlessly focused on the next quarter of profits, it's really hard to pull yourself out of that. And then there's strategies, though, around that. And maybe that's what needs to happen. Maybe there's strategies to spin off a part of the organization that is not creating the value that this shareholder base doesn't like. Companies do that all the time. Very interesting. Those are big strategic questions (laughs) that companies need to be grappling with and have to move quickly. Other derailers, I mean, I think those three really encompass and weave their way through every other one, I would say. Thanks for joining us. That ends segment three in episode 12. Look for episode 13 on your podcast feed in early October. And let's go back to the Treadway boardroom for famous last words. Avery Bullard must have known that once. But he'd become a little lost these last few years. The company had been saved. There were no more battles to win. Now he had to find something else to feed his pride. Bigger sales, more profits, something. And that's when we started doing things like this. The KF line. Walt, are your boys proud when they go out and sell this stuff? When they know the finish is going to crack, the veneer split off, and the legs come loose? Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's price merchandise. It serves a definite purpose in the profit structure of this company. We're not cheating anyone. Ourselves. At that price, the customer knows exactly what he's going to get. This? This is what Treadway has come to mean. And what do you suppose the people think of us when they buy it? How do you suppose the men in the factories feel when they make it? What must they think of a management that's willing to strip to selling this kind of junk in order to add a dime a year to the dividend? Do you know there are men at Pike Street who've refused to work on the KF line? Who've taken a seven and a half dollar a week cut to get transferred to something else? Well, after all, that's only part of our business. Eventually, we can cut down on the line. We'll drop that line. And we'll never again ask a man to do anything that will poison his pride in himself or his work. We'll have a line of low price furniture, a new and different line. As different from anything we're making today as a modern automobile is different from a covered wagon. That's what you want, Walt, isn't it? What you've always wanted, merchandise that will sell because it has beauty and function and value, not because the buyers like your scotch or think you're a good egg. The kind of stuff that you, Jesse, will be able to feel in your guts when you know it's coming off your production line. A product that you'll be able to budget to the nearest hundredth of a cent, Shaw, because it'll be scientifically and efficiently designed. And something you'll be proud to have your name on, Miss Treadway. We're going to give the people what they need at prices they can afford to pay. And as fresh needs come up, we'll satisfy them too with something new and even more exciting. And when we achieve that, we'll really start to grow. We're not going to die, we're going to live. And it's going to take every bit of business judgment and creative energy in this company, from the mills and the factories right to the top of the tower. And we're going to do it together, every one of us, right here at Treadway. I'm with you, Don. I take great pleasure in nominating Mr. McDonald Walling for the presidency of the Treadway Corporation. Second. I move we make it unanimous. All those in favor? Ms. Treadway? Yes. Mr. Caswell? Mr. Shaw? So voted. This podcast, Leadership Lyceum, the CEO's virtual mentor, has been a production of the Leadership Lyceum, LLC. The only purpose of the podcast is to educate, inform, and entertain. The information shared is based on the collection of experiences of each of the guests interviewed and should not be considered or substituted for professional advice. Guests who speak in this podcast express their own opinions, experience, and conclusions, and neither the Leadership Lyceum, LLC, nor any company providing financial support endorses or opposes any particular content recommendation or methodology discussed in this podcast. This has been a production of the Leadership Lyceum LLC, copyright 2017, all rights reserved.